Well, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Carl Rostrin today. Carl is a national recruiter for State Farm Insurance and Financial Services, founder of Roy's Rough and Rustic Rescue Relics, and president-elect of the Snow College Alumni Board. He's originally from Spring City, Utah. He graduated from Snow College and he was student body president while he was here. He has a bachelor's degree in social science from Southern Utah University and a master's degree from Utah State University. He's done lots of really cool and interesting things, which he's gonna to talk to you more about. So I'm gonna skip through some of this and just say he enjoys the outdoors, wandering through deserts, mountains, and valleys, metal detecting and collecting rock, bone, and other bounty, which he turns into jewelry and mountain man crafts. So please welcome Carl Rostrum. <clears throat> So, you know, I gave him 14 pages of bio, and I figured by the time he was done reading that, I could just say amen and sit down, and, and we call it good, but I, he opted out of that for some reason. I don't know. So it's, it's really good to be back on campus. Uh, I, I was the 100th student body president, so you can do math and kind of figure out maybe how, how old I am when I was here, but it, it was a great experience for me. Growing up in the booming metropolis of Spring City, you know, just up the road, coming to the big city of Ephraim was daunting and scary, um, but, but I survived it. And uh, it, it prepared me a lot for the things that were to come. Um, so things, I, I may have looked a little bit different back then. That's me in the middle uh, on the bottom sitting. But Snow College, like I said, it really prepared me for a lot of things. I, I never dreamed where my life would, would take me, I would end up. Uh, going from Spring City to working with uh, homeless people in Vegas overnight was something that, that was a little bit different. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have been to Las Vegas, but the similar, similarities between Ephraim and Sam Pete and Spring City and Las Vegas just aren't very plentiful. And so that's kind of that's where I found myself. But Snow College did help me prepare a little bit. Now, while I was here, I was known for my strong academic prowess. I, I was known for my rigid sense of conformity, uh, tenacious study habits, and uh, I had very little fun while I was here. So that, that did help me prepare a little bit. But anyway, my, my path is a little bit different. I, I've sat in on a couple of these, these lectures. I've watched several online, and you've been very fortunate to hear from a lot of the best, the brightest, people with a lot of, of success in their lives, drive and ambition, have been very successful in business endeavors. And so today, you get the opposite, I, I guess. That, that's why they put me at the end, I, I guess. So I, I'm just here to show you the example of what not to do, I, I guess. But um, I think it's, it's a good place for me to be at the end, because what I want to do is review a lot of what entrepreneurship is, a lot of what founding a business, being an owner, and preparing for that is, because a lot of my life I spent in helping people get to that point. So I, I may not have been great myself at it, but I worked on a lot of federal projects, programs. Uh, I spent 12 years with the state of Utah. I worked in Nevada, and, and currently still am helping people prepare to open businesses. So with the state of Utah, Well, let's go, with, uh, we'll go back up, entrepreneurship first. So what is it? Now there's a lot of different ways you can go into it. A lot of people go into opening their own business or entrepreneurship because they find something they really love and enjoy and they wanna make a living at it. And that's a great way to get into it. You've got passion already for something, you enjoy doing it. You know, going to work isn't a chore, it's something you enjoy doing every day. there's a niche out there that you can find. Somebody isn't doing it, or there's a way to make money doing a, a very specific or certain thing. You find a need that needs to be filled, and you can make money doing that. Of course, you can use an existing formula, like that currently I'm a recruiter for State Farm. I find people that want to become insurance agents and open their own insurance agency. So that's a formula that's already there. The same as with like franchising. You can find formulas that are already there and build in and jump in and build off of that. The trap I fell into is I found something I really loved and enjoyed, but when is it a hobby and when is it a business? 
you know, when are you able to devote full time to it? When are you able to take on the other aspects of business? You know, doing this is fun. I enjoy it. I made a little bit of money, but all the other stuff that goes with building and owning and growing a business, I didn't enjoy. And so we'll talk about that a little bit. And so, you know, that, that's kind of the catch-22. Um, my particular set of skills. So I spent a lot of time working on federal programs and grants in helping people start businesses. Uh, mostly in Sampy County, like I said, I spent 12 years, I worked for the Department of Workforce Services, I worked with vocational rehab, I worked at the prison systems, and I helped people think about, uh, grow, uh, develop plans, uh, come up with ideas, get funding through opening and, and marketing of new businesses. And so I, it, it was fun, it was enjoyable. Uh, state agencies, like I said, I currently work for private enterprise with State Farm, uh, personal endeavors that I help. So a culmination of a, a lot of years, I, I hope to share just a few things with you today just to give you some things to think about. So working in Sampy County, I, I actually covered the six county uh, rural area. And so a lot of times when I was helping people develop and find business ideas, they had to be something that could work here. Now, a lot of that time was before the onset of, of all the computer age, internet and technology that we have. We were just starting to help people. You need to start thinking of things you can do here, but market to the world. That was a new concept. Tells you how old I am. Um, my backpack, the stone tablets I carried in it were, was kind of rough, but that's what made me the, the, the strapping man I am today. Um, but it, it was a new concept. And so what we were doing is helping people find something that they could do here in Sampy that could, they could also sell and market and be successful at here in Sampy. I, I helped insurance agents. Uh, it was interesting. I went, uh, we did ink, equine massage. Uh, we opened a couple of those, uh, regular massage therapy, bait and tackle shops. We opened a few of those. And so very much something that they thought would, would grow, flourish, that they could do and, and be successful here in Sampy County. When I got to Vegas, no, well, that was a different story. You're not going to be massaging many horses on the strip. I, I don't know, some people probably do. We won't go into that part of it. But, but what I found in Vegas was something new, interesting, somewhat shocking, again, Coming from, from Spring City, uh, I, I should have noticed something was maybe a little bit different. My first day when I walked into my office in Vegas, there were actually bullet holes in the door, but I was too naive to actually think that through as to what that meant. Somebody had, I mean, how many of you have seen bullet holes everywhere here too? Every sign you pull up to, you know, bottles, cans, they've all got bullet holes in. So it didn't mean anything that my door actually had bullet holes in it. But but then as I started talking to people, I find out, oh, what, what is different here? What do they find here that, that fits one or, or, all, or all of those needs? And I found some interesting things. And so I'll share a couple of them with you. Maybe it's to open your minds and ideas uh, to, to things that you might can do. So one of the first people I met there, he, he explained his job or his business to me. He ran what he called an extraction company. Well, in Las Vegas, there are 150,000 hotel rooms. To put that into perspective, Provo has a population of about 120,000. So every night in Vegas, basically Provo, the whole area of Utah County packs up and comes to Vegas for the night. And so it's kind of boggling. Think of all the things that happen in Provo during the day. Every one of those things are happening in hotel rooms in Vegas every day as well. That's why I said what happens there stays there. They're very good at that because they don't want you to know, usually. Um, but the extraction company, people die while they're in the hotel rooms. And the last thing a, a hotel wants is to have a dead body being wheeled out through the foyer, right? So he ran a company 24 seven and all they did was go in as room service with tables and take bodies out of hotel rooms. 24-7, they were busy as could be, all right? A little niche market, right? Um, now, the second guy maybe was more interesting. 
So how many of you been to the Hoover Dam? Okay, a couple of you. Well, dams, if you've been to a dam, they, they don't build them straight down, right? They're concave, you know, it helps hold the pressure. But one of the big problems that you have with the dam is that people like to jump off of them. Sometimes with parachutes, sometimes without. And uh, he actually built a business cleaning the Hoover Dam from jumpers that, because you don't land at the bottom, you land about right here, and then you just slide to the bottom. And what's left isn't very much. So his job was actually to clean the Hoover Dam. So again, it's filling a need, right? So that's what we got, thinking outside the box, but respecting the box. That, that's kind of the way I put it. Um, I, I worked with a, with a group, we helped homeless, homeless teens. That's what we did. I had about 200 homeless teenagers I worked with in Vegas, and uh, we ran a, a homeless shelter, and in the hotel rooms and anywhere in the community in Vegas, one of the big problems are bed bugs. So he owned dogs that were specifically trained to sniff bed bugs. So he would run them through the hotels, and when they found a room with a problem, then they could isolate that problem before it grew. And so, you see, there's, there's all kinds of ways that you can fit in, build niches, and, and find a way to make a living. Now, there I was, I was this guy. I was pretty much every token white boy at any meeting I went to and uh, just as vanilla white as you can get. And, uh, and that was fine. I, I then went to work for a company where I traveled a lot. Um, I was working for a resort company, so I would go to Hawaii for three weeks, come home for a couple of days, I'd go to Sedona, then I'd go to Tahoe, then I'd hit California, go up the coast, and I was staying at all the best resorts and traveling and networking all the time I was meeting people, I was out in the world, everything in my life were kind of revolved around being out and, and people and being gregarious and, and all of this stuff. And then 2020 happened and the world shut down. And I was in my room, I'm in my house, in my pajamas all day, all night. That was it, that was my life. And, and for me, that drove me crazy. I was way too ADHD to sit in a room, to sit in my house, 24 seven every day. And fortunately I just started, at that time I had just transitioned from the resort company to State Farm. And State Farm sent me the computer and said, here's, here's your office. So you can work from anywhere just as long as, just as, long as you work, basically. And so, so, so I was fortunate enough to still make a living, but personally I was going nuts. I just absolutely going nuts. So, I had bought a metal detector, and I would spend, I always, when I was traveling all over, I would had my metal detector out. And uh, so in Hawaii, I'd be snorkeling with my metal detector, and in the mountains, I had my metal detector. And, and plus, I, I grew up hunting and fishing, and so I was always in the mountains doing something anyway. And I needed something to do. You know, I couldn't go out and see people, I wasn't traveling, and so, I started dragging everything I found home with me. And uh, the garage started to fill up. And uh, it started with this, this stuff. I mean, I'd find some old signs, uh, bottle caps and bullet shells and you know all the, all the worthless stuff you find metal detecting. But to me, it wasn't worthless, right? I, there was gonna be some value in this. And, and it was very interesting. I learned so much about history. I found Civil War, belt, uh, Civil War uniform buttons in the desert west of Las Vegas. And so then researching to find out how they got there, why they were there, and being educated that I didn't know that Lincoln was in trouble of not being reelected. And so right before the election, he sent a garrison of Union soldiers to Las Vegas to silver mine, but it gave Las Vegas, or it gave Nevada, who didn't have a population base large enough to become a state, now they had a population base large enough to become a state because there were Union soldiers there. And so, Nevada became a state 
on Halloween, October 31st, for an election on November 3rd. And so that I, I found where the Union soldiers were camped west of Vegas, and so I was finding all kinds of Union soldier stuff. But anyway, so, so the history in that w was fascinating to me. But, uh, you know, bullet shells, I have like 14 pages of individual bullet shells I've cataloged. A lot of them, and, and horseshoes going back to Europe in the 1800s because it's right on the Spanish trail. And so history, it was, it was fascinating to me and I was learning a lot, but that wasn't quite enough for me. And dragging all the stuff home to research and the stuff started getting bigger. And pretty soon, I bones, I, know, I can drag skulls home and I can clean them up and I can do something with them. And so pretty soon I had a garage. I mean, I had a lot of elk bones and heads and I had uh, some cougar and coyote and teeth and and uh, pretty soon my, I couldn't fit the car in the garage because my hobby had, had expanded my capacity to host the hobby. And so, of course, my wife very thrilled with having a garage full of bones and all the neighbors going, what, what's, what's that guy doing over there? She said, you got to get rid of them. And uh, the other part of entrepreneurship is the ingeniousness and ingenuity to have a reason to have the business, right? So right then it popped into my mind, they're not just filling the garage, that's my new business. I'm gonna make money cleaning these up, creating things, all this artistic ability of mine that had been pent up for a lifetime was now going to come flowing out and I was going to make all this money selling the garbage I found in the desert and a few dead animals. You know, hey, the overhead's terrific. You know, some peroxide and some glue and, and your business. And so that's, that's kind of how this started. I, I started making a few rings, some jewelry, and I would put it online. My, my only marketing um, was OfferUp, and I would put stuff on OfferUp. And then I started doing some small bones, uh, the vertebrae of, of elk sit nicely, they have a nice hole in them, paint them up, clean them up a little bit, stick a candle in them, got a candle all over it. I mean, come on. Halloween was coming up, and so I thought, at least for Halloween, I'm gonna push some bones, you know? And uh, so I sold a few, but eh, it wasn't what I thought. So after Halloween, I had all these bones with candles stuck in them, and so I just took a picture, I probably had like 100 of them, and put it on, and I said, hey, I gotta get rid of this stuff. and my offer up page blew up. And I was thinking, hey, what, what am I missing? And they were the raw They weren't painted cute. They didn't have ghosts on them or anything. They were just raw bone, basically. And so I started selling and I would meet people, you know, in a casino parking lot, and open up my trunk and pull out some bones. And it was, I, it's Vegas, nobody notices anything. So. But, but I was selling quite a few of these at seven bucks a pop. And I, finally I asked, I said, I mean, why? And the gal was very kind enough to talk to me. And she said, well, there's a very big Wiccan population here in Vegas. And, uh, and I was like, oh. I never thought of that, you know, not knowing a whole lot about it anyway. But And so she educated me a little bit. She said, you should come. We have our own fairs, and you should come to them. I mean, what you do is just right up our alley. She said, the only problem, I mean, I mean, we, you can't stereotype what we look like, but but seriously, you look like not what, not what would do well at, at our market. And so then the wheels got turning, and I became the eccentric artist. Oh, one more. Uh, oh, I, hey, I got stuff. This is stuff. So I started making, so uh, business card holders. I, do, I did pretty well with those in the business community. Some rings uh, that I'd make out of bullet shells. There's some of the necklaces that I do. The, the cross necklaces always sold real well for me. And there's bad picture of some of my bone candles. And then I'd get a little fancy with them. But 
Then the eccentric artist came. And I went from selling $7 a whack to $300. I would make some, I made a, a cool lamp out of a cougar skull. Uh, I made, I mean, some, some of the elk femurs, you know, were this big, and I would do a full set of candles on those and sell them for 150 bucks. Um, this is a jewelry holder I made. And so I went to selling 300 bucks a pop. Anybody, they came, they, I, I was doing pretty well. And there wasn't anybody else in Vegas doing it at the time. Um, well then, man, if I can sell 300 bucks a pop, what am I doing, you know? Uh, I still had to work for State Farm because, you know, insurance is a big thing, stability is a big thing, and really it takes a lot of 300 bucks at a pop to make up for what I make at State Farm. It does. And, but as far as fun, I was having a lot of fun. It was fulfilling for me, and and you know, you dared meet somebody in a parking lot at midnight with your masks on and you weren't afraid that the you know, mask police were going to come and arrest you for contact or something. And so during the pandemic, you know, I was just kind of like this big black market bone smuggler in Vegas. <laughs> you know, there, there I was. And uh, you know, I just kind of let my hair go and, and everything else go because I wasn't meeting people for work anymore. And so it didn't matter what I looked like. And so I wasn't worried about being the clean cut business guy anymore. And you know, if I got out of pajamas, I was lucky. I thought, hey, I'm doing good today. And so it worked, you know, just a change in my persona for this particular business worked wonders. And when, and later on, when I would go to craft fairs and stuff, you'll see I, I, I changed even more because people, when they're buying handmade crafts and homemade crafts, things like this, and you look like somebody that would make it, your sales go through the roof, all right? That's just the way it went, and, and, I, and I did pretty well. So now I'm at a crossroads. <sighs> things are going well, but how much time do I really have to devote to this? Again, going back, hobby versus business. You know, so I called you know, around the licensing and stuff in Vegas, um, small business center, went over and met with them. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for other people my whole life, but when it came to doing it for me, I suddenly became really stupid. And, and I wanted a lot more help than what I usually gave people. You know, I, there was a lot of things I just didn't know and understand, and, and quite honestly, didn't want any part of. The, the thought of the taxes, you know, incorporation, all of that stuff was just something I didn't want any part of. And so I was, you know, trying to get some help and figure it out. Do I really want to do this? And I, driving through the desert in Arizona on one of my trips, I, I just happened to see this little kind of antique craft store sitting there. And uh, I stopped and went in and I was talking to them. And I said, well, you know, I make, you know, some rings. and." elk ivory with a badger claw, kind of a yin-yang kind of look, and then I do all this stuff, and they were like, oh man, that'll sell really good here. And I said, well, I don't have a business license, I don't have anything, and they said, perfect. Uh, we, this little city that I was in in Arizona didn't require business licenses for anything. They just, they didn't have anybody to check on it, just something they never worried about. And so I set up shop in a little town, Mojave Valley, in, in Arizona, and I, I bought some jewelry displays and made a bunch of stuff, and I was doing all right. For a little teeny shop in the middle of nowhere that really there was one sign out front, you had to try really hard to find it. And a few people found it, and when they did, I, I developed a pretty loyal following down there. People were buying the stuff. Uh, and I'd circumvented the system because I didn't have a business license. I wasn't paying tax, I, you know, shh. Um, you know, I thought, I'd, I thought I'd, I'd found found a way. Then the phone rings one day, and it's the owner. She goes, man, we're really sorry to tell you this, but somebody busted the front window out at the store last night, and uh, the only things they took 
were your jewelry cabinets. They cleaned them out under the whole store, and it was a fairly large store. I mean, even the owners, they had a lot of silver jewelry in their cabinets, and uh, but the only thing that they took, they, they wiped me out. And for a guy that when it's a hobby, and you don't think about something like insurance, and of course they didn't have insurance because they were a consignment shop, so they didn't insure, if they did have insurance, it was only on their stuff, you know, or, or just on damage to the store. And so, as a, as a small time hobby business, to lose, to lose three or $4,000 overnight, I mean, that was the end of that for me, you know. And uh, so, so that was kind of the lesson, lesson learned there. Uh, it, it's nice to have hobbies. It's nice to have things and passions and loves. But you need to have a business hat on, too. And even I've been teaching people that my whole life. For me, it didn't. I wasn't interested. So, so that, so here's my tale, my tale of failure. No, um, learned a lot, have fun. I still poke around, you know, sell a few things, but, but I learned very quickly. I didn't have the complete mindset to be successful in business. It wasn't that important to me. I wanted a hobby. And I've seen this throughout my life. A lot of people learn that same lesson. And, and it's something you really need to consider and think of, no matter which one of all those areas that we went through. So anyway, some more of this, this is kind of the stuff I evolved into, uh, more of the mountain man or native crafts. Um, I sell a, sold a ton of, of rattlesnake stuff out in the desert. Buffalo tooth, and this is what what I became at the craft fairs. This is actually me in San Francisco, and all oh, they loved me, they loved me there. So, the moral of the story: sometimes it could be that the purpose of our life is just to serve <laughs> as a warning to others. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. Now, is that a downer? It really isn't. Because if you read and you study the lives of people who are successful, they failed. Or as they would rather, but they learned. Now I learned, I learned that I really want a hobby, I don't want a business. A very valuable lesson. So I'm not gonna lose $4,000 overnight any, at any other time in my life, at least doing this. I'll, I'll probably find some other way to do it, but it won't be doing this. So. Part of why I really wanted to come today, share that part of it with you, but also, as Russ mentioned, I, I work on the alumni board, or with the, I'm on the alumni board here at Snow. And part of what we do is we try to get alumni back on campus to talk to students. We try to get them to engage. One of the most important things you can do as a student, and at any point in your life, is to develop contacts, develop networks. Develop people that you can call on that, that have been there, that can give you sound advice and give you ideas, things you may not have thought of. And so, thinking of it from the point of, of an alum, somebody that's been here, somebody that's, that's kind of gone through it, what would I leave with you besides this thing that I tried a small business, found out it wasn't for me, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, what are some other things that I would share with you? Kind of on, on a bigger picture. So, here's what I have for you. Here, here's, here's my mentorship, my, my advice as, a, as an old gray hair that, that's gonna teach you. If, if I sat with you one-on-one, -on -one, this, this is what I would and what I do tell, tell people. You're limited only by imagination and determination. I had a great imagination, that didn't limit me. My determination to really run a business, I, I just, I don't have it, and that's fine. Um, but by the examples I gave you, by my own, really anything you can think of, 
you can probably spend a way to, to make some money off of it. it. It's the imagination to do it and then the determination to follow through with it. Second thing I would tell you is people are people. I've given you some ideas today. Um, you're going to have lots of classes and courses and you're gonna meet lots of people that are gonna give you rules, laws, idioms, ways to be successful. If you follow this formula, you will be successful. You follow this, you're going to lose weight. You do this in an interview, you're going to get hired. And one of the things I discovered are there are no rules, formulas that hold fast in every case because you're dealing with people. You're dealing with human beings and every one of us are different. I go into an interview and, and I do what the interview coach told me and perfectly, word for word, I have the best stories, the best antidotes, I, I painted a great picture, but for some reason that human sitting over there and I didn't connect. So understand there are places for you and they're not gonna be everywhere. You're not going to get along with everybody. You're not going to appreciate everybody that you meet and that's fine. Learn what you can from them, contribute to their lives, and, and go on. Go on with yours. Next, ask questions. You don't know what you don't know. And lots of times what you think you know isn't true. So never stop asking questions. If you have a situation that you're in, the ability to ask somebody a question, ask them the question. One of the things, like I said, I ran a homeless youth program in Vegas. I tried to get homeless kids jobs. And the best tool I had was a bus ticket. I would buy him a bus ticket. I would say, go ride the bus all day and talk to everybody on that bus and find out where do you work, what do you do, who's hiring. And that's how they got jobs. It wasn't like going door to door and trying to get an interview and turning in a resume because and an application when they didn't have anything. But now they knew somebody that worked at a company and they could say, oh, I talked to so-and-so, he said you're hired. All right, don't fear learning. It doesn't hurt for long. You can, you can get over it, go on, but learn. The important part is the learning from it. Surround yourselves with support. Find the people that can help you do the research necessary to be successful. Think outside the, spot, outside the box, but respect the box. Uh, we hear it all the time, think outside the box. And I've seen people think outside the box to the point where they're a little too far gone. All right, you still have to respect there's a box. All right, and I tried to beat the box, okay? I, I was gonna get the box wood and not the cardboard folded in on it and I didn't apply to me anywhere. I was, that didn't work. All right, uh, realize your limitations and find experts to help you. There was mine. I wasn't willing to learn and I wasn't willing to find the experts to help me. It just, to me, it wasn't that important. But for you, and, and when I hire people and when I coach hiring, I always tell people, if I, if I hire 10 people like me, we might have a fun time at work, but we're going to fail. I need to hire people who excel at my weaknesses. I need to hire people that think different from me so that we have different aspects, avenues, ways of thinking. So we have different points of view. We have different ideas coming in. So find an expert, never assume. So many times I've, I've interviewed a lot of people for businesses and they always assume they knew everything that, that went on at our company. I mean, you look at Coca-Cola and you think, okay, they make Coke. They put squirt juice in a bottle and people drink it. There's a whole world of jobs that goes on there. And, and we assume that we know everything. Never assume that you know. Uh, let life teach you. So oftentimes we're, we're resistant to change. We're resistant to bad things happening. When something bad happens, we fall apart. Rather than understanding, learning, and being taught from it. Uh, this morning, it just kind of hit me as I was thinking through this. So oftentimes we hear give up or I gave up or they gave up or don't give up. And I was thinking what an impact or, or what, what strength there is just in those two words, give up. Because the word give shows that you have total control over it. 
It's not something that happened to you. You gave it away. And the word give has all the power in the world. So when next time you think of giving up at anything, think, I have total power over the word give. If I'm to give a gift or give a present, but also if I give this away, it's my choice. I'm doing it actively and willingly. So when you hear that, when you're having self-doubt or when things are cloudy for you, think, I still have the control over this to give it away. All right, um, be adaptable. And last of all, enjoy the ride. The last place on earth I ever thought I would be living in is Las Vegas. And uh, very quickly, my first week in Vegas, I ended up at the MGM Grand announcing title fight weigh-ins with Michael Buffer for a title fight that was happening that night at the MGM. Okay, I just drove out of Ephraim, heard a radio contest on the way down. Hey, come and be a buffer for a day. Now, if you know Michael Buffer and, and the Buffers, they've patented about everything you can patent when it comes to public address announcing for sports. So let's get ready to rumble, all that stuff. You're not even allowed to say it anymore. They own it. Okay, so they do all the UFC fights. They do all the heavyweight uh, boxing fights. And so there I am at the MGM with Michael Buffer announcing a title fight that night. Okay, I'm a kid from Spring City, all right? Um, I already mentioned the travel. How many of you have been to Caesars, to the forum shops? Okay, I mean, they're huge. They have animatronic shows. They have, you know, Zeus and things fighting. I spent several nights in there all alone. The place totally empty, and it's a whole different perspective working security. And... How many of you heard electric, the Electric Daisy Carnival? It, it's a big EDM festival, 150,000 kids a night, seven stages uh, of EDM going on, and all, all the stars are there. Matter of fact, Drew Carey tells a story of the night that I was with him on, on some of his comedy stuff. So there I am, I'm a Drew Carey. Uh, I spent a night with Katy Perry, walking her around. The worst... Um, Paris Hilton, I had to carry Paris Hilton wearing a metal bikini over my shoulder through 150,000 people as she is screaming at the top of her lungs that she's being attacked by aliens. Okay, so you never know where life is going to take you. Be open to it and enjoy the ride. It may not be where you want to go. It may not be anything you've ever thought of. But the things you can learn, the things you can see, the development that you can have personally is something that, that you don't get by closing yourself off to the world. And you don't get it by giving it all away through the phrase give up. So thank you for having me today. I wish you the best of luck. And if you need mentorship in that, contact you know, the alumni board here and, and, and we'll try and hook you up. Anyway, thank you. Yeah.